you learn a lot of tricks that way. I yeah. mean, I've, there's been times where I've come out the burnout box and like intentionally shut a car off and made it look like it's broke. And then they're like, oh, they think they got a you know, easier uh, way. And then you fire back up, put in the beams and they're like, wait, whoa, it just happened kind of deal. You know, it's yeah, that a would lot throw of tricks. Them off. Yeah. yeah, that's wild. So I definitely don't want to try to take your spot at Walmart. It sounds like you would fist fight over like a good parking spot. Yeah, or that or just park over top, yeah. Like if the windows go down and Dr. Dre comes on, it's like, all right, leave. Oh, I'm gonna get out of this guy's way. <laughs> yeah. Welcome back to In the Isles, presented by O'Reilly Auto Parts. I'm your unreliable host, Derek Beery, and today I have a very, very special guest. He's a mechanic, a builder, a drag racer, burnout connoisseur, boat captain. Yeah. You've seen it on Cletus McFarland. You know him probably as Jack Stan Jimmy, Mr. James Tall. How's it going? Good, good, how are you? Good, man. Thanks for uh, making the time. I can't even imagine how busy you are. You're like everywhere. Yeah. Somehow today you're gonna to be in Texas or California at another event or somewhere else. Yeah, might end up in Iowa by the end of the day, you never know. <laughs> so thank you very much. A lot of people don't know this. It's gonna kind of give away our timeline, but. We just had a uh, Cletus and Cars event last night, and you threw down some pretty hardcore skids last yeah. night. Yeah, I definitely went in there and sent it. Um, actually was told that I had to win, and rivals and white trash, the you know, undefeated burnout truck, but then I was told I got disqualified because I had done left the pad. I tried to tell him my dad owns the place, but it didn't fly. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed you were kind of going out the ins and in the outs. And... Yeah, you know, sometimes you just gotta be different. Do it, <laughs> do what the people want to see, and that's what I went for with that. Yeah, it was it was really fun watching because I was like, why is there smoke on the bank on the entry? And I'm like, oh, he's there. Just, he is. Up he's there. doing a second uh, second run at it. Yeah, second run. Didn't like the first one maybe. And then you had some tough luck and. Killaby, who was putting down an amazing skill. Yeah, and another one right before the tires popped, the motor popped. So I secured a first loser, runner up in the pro class. But coming off a big win in Bristol is okay to yeah. you know, take Brist the second place. Bristol is the place to win. You doubled down. Doubled down in Bristol. Yeah, yeah. Took, the, took the championship, I guess you could call it. Yeah. I won't, uh, I won't lead you to spoil anything, but do you have some big plans coming for Killaby as far as engine? Motor? Yeah, we have, we have a, a spare bullet sitting, waiting. That's uh, all brand new everything. So okay. that's going to come. Um, probably see a little bit of dyno footage after we get it back together just to see where it's at power level wise because that thing has a big blower on it. It's a 1471. <laughs> Being the biggest blower in the shop, we got to see what it makes for power. Yeah, the uh, the height of the engine overall is actually taller than the car, is it not? Yeah, it's right there. Uh, blower hat. It's got a low pro blower hat. It's still at the roof line of the car. <laughs> Jeez, thing is wild. If you haven't been to a burnout competition, you guys really got to check this stuff out. And what's great is the open competition is getting like deep. It's yeah, big. It was, there is. I want to say there's 47 competitors in open comp yesterday. That's wild. That's did insane. You, yeah. Did you ever think? When you guys did the first Cletus and Car, were you there the first one? Yeah, when I went to the, I was actually not employed when I was at the first Cletus and Cars, but at the first Cletus and Cars, I brought actually one of my cars to race because it was at the drag strip. And then I seen the burnout stuff and I was like, man, I got to build a burnout car. Yeah. Fast forward a year later and I'm employed for Cletus <laughs> yeah. and I had built me a burnout car. There was what, like, 500 people there, yeah. maybe? It was ish. very small. It was at the drag strip. We, they had a bald eagle there that you could take pictures with, a real life bald <laughs> eagle. It was this definitely one of those things, you know, growing up at a racetrack, I was like, man, this is insane to see this happen. This yeah. is, I was like, man, this is really good for the sport. I feel it's gonna grow to something huge. Yeah, it was, it's wild today to just, when you get a breather and you could look at the stands just full and just the smoke everywhere. Yeah. You probably see the Freedom Factory from space. Oh like yeah. The program. yeah, you can see the smoke and the, and the lights from space most yeah. likely. Yeah. What's insane about that too is you'll see that same guy that gets there the second the gates open and he's standing holding that fence up right next to the burnout pad from the time we say go to the we say we're done. Yeah. He is just there screaming the whole time. Yeah. It's that core group of fans like that though that just makes it worth it. Uh, it's so fun to be involved in it and everything. I got to ask you right away, what is your favorite aisle at O'Reilly Auto Parts? I got two. There's definitely two aisles I always hit when in O'Reilly's, and that's definitely the performance wall. Oh, because yeah. Because they always have those little knickknacks you forget on a project yep. that you, grow, you know you're going to need. And then 
I really like the like the Permits XL where they got all the different you know, oh, silicones yeah. and sealants and stuff. Because I like to keep not only like my race trailer, but my garage stocked of that stuff. So I always skim that aisle, get the stuff I know I'm getting low on or out of. Because there's always that time where you ain't got the gasket you need and you oh, just yeah. kind of goop her up. Yeah. All right, straight to the man question then. Ultra gray or ultra black? I'm a big ultra gray guy. All right, we're on the same page. That's good. Is the quick set, the one minute stuff? Depends on depends on how urgent the job is. <laughs> if it's an if it's an in the garage job, I, I do the sixty minute. But if I'm at the racetrack, you best believe it's the yeah. quick set. Well, that looks like a leak. Yeah, there done. it is. Yeah, that's awesome. So, how long have you been involved in the car community? Obviously, everybody knows that you're a heck of a ranch, heck of a driver. When did this start? Was were you were you knee high to a grasshopper? Yeah, or? it was. Yeah, it pretty much came out the womb into it. Uh, my dad's always been involved in motorsports. He actually owned a shop um, when I was born. He already was a mechanic and owned a shop at the time. Did general automotive repair, but was a he specialized in transmissions, but mainly did all of the race transmissions for pretty much every local guy oh, that wow. drag race. Yeah. So, pretty much was born into the into the scene of cars and whatnot. And my entire childhood was you're not doing this, don't be a mechanic, use your head, not your hands. But I would leave elementary school and go sit in the office at the shop, do my homework, and then instantly be in the shop digging in bolts, nuts, tearing stuff apart that was broke, and it just evolved to what it is now. Sure, that's awesome. So a question that I get asked a lot, which I am not, people say, are you like AC3 certified or whatever the stuff is uh do you have any certifications or licenses or is it so i never tested for myself but i did take the test when i was 14 for my dad and, and passed the asc master wow. technician it, it was a renewal test for him but i did it for him just to see if i was you know so you got the book smarts enough. yeah yeah and that was that School, not so much, but a master technician, <laughs> book smart, yeah, I have that. You want the torque spec yeah. on a torque converter? I got it. <laughs> yeah. No, that's cool. You know, I'm the same way. Like, a lot of people are like, oh, you got to have some sort of certification. It's like, yeah. no, I just learned in the backyard or the shop or the garage. Well, I mean, in, I've seen both aspects of it, and I feel as if, if you aren't afraid to do the trial by error and fail to figure out how something works, you'll learn more of that way than just reading a book because a book can only tell you so much. Right. You know, when you're doing it with your hands, that's when you're like, oh, that's how that works. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I commit, personally, I commit to memory more when I make a mistake. Like if you hit your hand with a hammer, yeah. you know it hurts. If you read, don't hit your hand with a hammer. Yeah, well, you're like, I can. yeah, yeah, I'm sure I can be fine right. if I hit my hand until you actually do it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So we'll get into some of your projects in a little bit, but I think the listeners and the viewers need to know, what does James drive for a daily driver? What do you go to town with? So it's a very open-ended question for me because it depends <laughs> on who I have with me. I have a few daily drivers. The go-to family hauler though is definitely my Ram. Yeah. You know, 2015 Ram 3500. Yeah. Similar to your truck, you know, it's got yeah. the wheels and tires yeah. in it. It's a comfortable vehicle to drive anywhere. Yeah. But if it's just me, and I got to run into town real quick. It's it's one of my T40s. Uh, a lot nice. of people don't know it, but I'm a big Nissan guy, Nissan T40 guy at heart. And uh, I have a bone stock 92 coupe that I just, it's suspension, wheels, tires, handles really well, but it's a bone stock motor five speed car. And it just, I take it everywhere. Go zip around on that Yeah, thing. it just goes zip around yeah. everywhere in that thing. I'm the same way. Like, it's like, well, who's going with me? How far are we going? Yeah. And what's the weather? Because it's like wipers, heaters, brakes. Things like that. Yeah. And then, My big thing is AC or not. If the wife's coming <laughs> with, it's got to have AC. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Wow. We don't. I don't think I got AC other than my my truck. But yeah, the other day I went to town and the wife's like, "Well, I'll meet you there." And I was like, "All right, I'm coming." She's like, "Where are you going?" I'm like, "I'm going back to Rusty Acres." She's like, "Why?" I'm like, "I think I'm going to take the 52 Packard." She's like, <laughs> "Why? It hasn't run Ooh. in like two years." I'm like, "I don't know. It'll be fun. It sounds fun." Yeah barely made it had to wire the choke open but got me to town so how many projects do you currently have we see one in the background here yeah this is this is probably one of my longer running projects a lot of people don't know but i i'm 30 now bought this car when i was 18 and it was a street car drove it to high school oh wow and here it sits rendition uh two and a half i'd call it getting a new new power plant and whatnot but i currently have that i own and i 
I only know this because I counted just a few days ago, 12, oh, 12, 12 projects. How do you manage the time? Like, is, are you dedicated to this now or do you like sprinkle your, cause you're also I, yeah. wrenching obviously with yeah, Cletus. So, so I'm in a full-time wrench for Cletus. And then, you know, that's a full-time job, 40 to 65, 70 hours a week, depending on how busy we are. So all my projects get what I call B shift. So go to work, put in my time, come home, do the family man stuff. The second kids go to bed. I'm in the garage until, you know, one, two, three, four o'clock in the morning, depending on Jeez. how urgent a project is. Yeah. And, uh, you know, sleep, sleep when I can kind of deal. And that's how I get through it. You always seem to pull it off. Cause like I'll see updates or chat with you or whatever. And you know, the one time I stopped by and you're like, yeah, this is going to be ready for the race. And I can't remember what it was four days. And it looked similar to this. Yeah. And I'm like, Dude, there's just parts everywhere. There's no way. Apart. Doesn't even look like you a car. show up and pull the wheels. I'm like, how does that happen? Yeah, um, a lot of it is uh, self-driving motivation. Just I dedicated to the sport of racing. I, I always tell people like, if you want something, you just got to do it. Yeah. Like no one can tell you no if you're doing it for yourself. So you just put in the time. Yep, make it happen. When yeah. was your first drag race? First pass. So I should let like, me clarify. Let's not do. The street race, allegedly. Yeah, uh, yeah. Let's I'll do, do on the tree. First drag race in a car at the drag strip um, was in my Nova, actually. So Really? Yeah. Wow. That my 1964 Nova I have was actually my dad's. He bought it when I was a kid. I was seven, eight years old when he bought it. A uh, guy worked for him, had a motor, put it in it. They raced it. He then left to open his own shop. So when I was 13, my dad was like, hey, if you're into this sport, you want to go racing, put together a small block, we'll put it in the car and you can drive it. So about 13 years old, put together a 408, put it in the car. I would test doing burnouts and, and trans braking, line locking in the parking lot. Turned 14, my dad's like, I think you're ready. Towed it down to Bradenton Motorsports and uh, put in the beams. And wow. first time ever down the drag strip was in that car. I went, I think I went like a, 022 on the tree, went Jeez. out the quarter on the motor, and went a 1023 at 130 mile an hour. And wow. that was the first pass I ever made. So you didn't even run it to the 300 or the 1,000? Right, just... right to the quarter mile. Wow. And then uh, second pass I made was to the eighth of the nitrous on, and it went a 587. Jeez, very good. I, for some reason, I was under the impression you just picked that Nova up a couple years ago, but it's a family mm -hmm. heirloom. Yeah, no, I've. So I've raced the car from the time I was 14 to you know current day, still still yeah. do. And then I purchased the car from my dad when I was 18. Okay. So I've owned the car like this one for you know 12 years. And that's a no time car mostly, right? Yeah, I mean I will do some like street car shootout style stuff because it is a tag registered insured car. Like I, I mean I drive it to work occasionally, but a lot of the no time stuff down here in Florida, you know, between like Florida no time and all them guys, they promote some pretty big healthy races that have really good payouts and they yep. do like an invitational style shootout to where yes there is no you know times on the board but they try to pick a core group of like 32 cars that they think are within two tenths of each other so it's wow. some of the closest racing that's competitive yeah it's super competitive so you can go in thinking you're the underdog and end up in the win nice. you know well i mean cutting the light sounds like it's yeah really important what you yeah. do really good at. <laughs> yeah i knew i i never was the fastest car in whatever class I raced, but I knew I was one of the better drivers always. So I knew that if I did my job, I was there with a car that was consistent. And right. with a consistent car with a driver that can just, you know, drill the tree, it's hard to beat. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So I got to ask you, because I've got some pretty good hacks of my own, but what's the most ridiculous hack that you want to admit to doing that worked? Like something that you're like, <laughs> don't do this at home. Yeah. But. Um, I mean, there's been a few times where I've made passes with things in vehicles that shouldn't have been ratchet straps holding things into place. Um, <laughs> I knew this was coming. <laughs> I mean, no one knows it, but last night on the burnout pad, one of those rear wheels had two lug nuts on it on white oh, trash. Oh my but, goodness. Uh, <laughs> probably the worst one I've done is, uh, it really was like a series of unfortunate events, but ended up with uh, two different pistons and a motor with two different cylinder heads to make a round of racing. Wow. And uh, no one thought it would happen, but went out there and car left. One side had little flames, one side had really big flames, and no one understood why, but it was because one half of the motor had about an extra two points of compression than the other half. They're like, he put in some custom cam or something. Yeah. So you had no consistent compression or nope. quench or nothing on that No, nope, but it worked. Wow. 
Did it sound radical? It had to. Have it sounded different. like it was not healthy until it was on the kit leaving. <laughs> so like a crop plane or something. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. So when you pick a project, like what what makes a project appealing to you? Like that's something I want to build. I like I like stuff that's a little different sometimes. I mean, you've seen my Fairmont, you know, it's a yeah. photo of Fairmont that looks like it was pulled out of the weeds, you know, yeah. it's got a door bend in and all that stuff, that but thing. it's a, you know, turbo LS swap deal, real yeah. sleeper. It's just stuff that, uh, stuff that appeals to me is like stuff that's different. I mean, I have my like core cars, like dream cars I want to build, you know, like I want to do like a 68 or 69 Firebird eventually Ooh, and stuff yeah. like that, you know, yeah. but I just like different, yeah. you know. Where we, we see eye to eye on that because even if I get a car that's somewhat familiar to people, I'll do a different engine or keep something original or do something everyone's like, why would you do that? Because yeah. I want to be different. I yeah. don't want to follow the line, so yeah. to speak, you know? So I mean, that's like, I mean, prime example, my, you know, my 240 race car, it's a twin turbo LS swap, solid axle rear end, but it's a 240. Like people don't expect <laughs> yeah. you to do that to that kind of deal, you know? What mile per hour are you running that thing? It's been 178 in the eighth. I'm looking at the cage right now and I would be terrified. It's got enough there to be safe. It could definitely benefit from having more, though. You, you thinking about doing a hoop, a halo? Yeah, it's or gonna get it. It's gonna get a funny car cage and yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that thing is a rocket ship. Yeah, it does its job. So, what's your favorite decade of automobiles? Then, are you like '90s guy or like? I'm a I, well, I'm a hard, I'm a hot rod at heart. You know, okay. '60s, even '50s. Some you know, like a like a '51 Chevy, like love them. Old, old shoebox stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then like the 60 hot rods really, really pull out the heartstrings. Yeah. But, you know, I'm a, I'm a 90s kid. I grew up, you know, my, kind of like you, you grew up as a kid seeing yeah. all those old hot rods. Well, I grew up as a kid seeing all the, the 90, you know, like muscle car import style stuff of that sure. genre. So now that I'm, you know, getting older again, it's like, you know, like, yeah, that, that stuff kind of is coming back. You know, you see it a lot. Like, I mean, you've seen the third gen Camaros selling for oh, 50, crazy 60 money. grand a week of and stuff yeah. like that. And, I used to buy those for eight hundred dollars, run them yeah. for a week, and flip them. Yeah, <laughs> I used to do the same thing when I was yeah. thirteen, fourteen. I'd buy, you know, an eighty nine S ten, put a small block in it, turn around, sell it. I'd have, you know, eleven hundred bucks on the whole project. Right. It's crazy how things have changed. Yeah. So you don't really have a decade then. You're just car. I'm truck. all over it. Yeah. What's cool? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I definitely some of the modern stuff, you know, the present day hot rod stuff, really kind of doesn't do it for me. So if I had to guess, it'd be Favorite, I would go 60s. Nice, okay. Second favorite, if we could split 85 to 95. I'll, we can do that, yeah. we'll make an exception. Write that down. <laughs> All right, here is a controversial conversation. In some cases, conventional or synthetic oil? So my thing is performance motor, conventional, 100%. Just so throw I'm some a, dinosaurs in there. Yeah, as pure as it gets, uh, you know, growing up in a transmission shop, the biggest thing is you see a lot of guys, you gotta have synthetic this, transmission fluid and that for, for this, you know, performance application. The purest ATF you can get, the cheapest stuff on the shelf is the best thing for it. I use hydraulic oil. Yeah, same, same thing. The purest, you know, like 303 or... <laughs> get in the cheap old yeah. drum and just oh, yeah. bloop, throw well, it in. Well, that's good because like a lot of people don't know the viscosity of the hydraulic fluid being thicker will actually tighten up a converter. So if you put together a project and you're like, man, this converter is way too loose. Throw some uh, hydraulic fluid in there and it'll tighten, tighten right. it right back up. Same with the tractor fluid. That's awesome. What's your most frustrating project or restoration that you've ever done? Do you have one where you're like, you, it, probably not because you're very focused on getting them done, but do you have one where like a little bit at a time and you're like, nope, shelve it, I'll come back. And you're kind of just not I, getting to the finish line. I do have one of those. And it's, it's not necessarily that I get burned out on that project. The second I, well, I have so many projects going on. So the second I get held up on one, it just gets shelved and I go to the next one. And it's, it's kind of crazy because like I'll accumulate all these parts for these projects. So I have, I have parts for every project I have. I just don't have the time <laughs> to dedicate to put all the parts on sure. said project. So once I get, you know, to a, the, either a stopping point or a part where I'm held up on it, I have the bad habit of it gets shelved and the next one gets brought I, on so similar same way yeah or if i are like situation like this where i break it you know <laughs> yeah. then it's like okay all hands on deck on this one everything else gets ignored yeah when's this going to be back probably within two weeks uh big hold up on parts uh mainly because you know it was a barred motor in the car that that i broke 
So I'm gonna fix the barred motor and then my motor's done just waiting on the cylinder heads to show up. So once I have heads, it'll be back. So you're it. building two motors essentially? Uh, five. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I have that many at the machine shop for <laughs> all my projects, but yes. <laughs> I had four, now I'm fixing a fifth. Feeling less manly by the minute. That's, that's great. I need more motors laying around, apparently. It becomes bad when you start looking at, like, somebody's, I just got this motor back from the machine shop. I'm selling it kind of thing instead of looking at fixing your motor because you're like, yeah, that one's already done. Let me just get it for now, and then mine will be done in right. a month. Yeah. So I know it's you're kind of in the same line as, as a lot of folks that I talk to where sometimes you can't have music when you're working because of the content creator stuff. But yeah. When you do listen to music, it's probably more so at home. What kind of music do you listen to when you wrench? Is there a style or genre? It really depends on the focus of the project. If I'm just by myself hustling in the garage, grinding, trying to get it done, it's definitely 90s to early 2000s hip hop and rap. Okay. Just right. going in the background, usually loud enough to where the wife will text me two or three times saying, turn it down. But <laughs> it definitely. So Don't we're talking like, about half of what they say, but I just, it's just something with the music. The beat. And then, yeah, yeah, it just makes me keep it's going. It's like some Warren G and some yeah, Dr. Dre. I mean, and, yeah, 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 yeah right. exactly that. I'll yeah. look at the clock. It's like 1130 and I'm like, all right, get the music going. Next scene, I look at it again. It's 3, 340 in the morning. I'm like, oh, wow. That's time wild. has flown. But when you get into those grooves, so much gets done. And once yeah. you get one thing ticked off, you're like, okay, now I can just do this little thing over here. And then it starts oh, yeah. just rolling. Do you have any driving music? Is it the same? Like if you're getting ready to go into lanes, do you listen to music or anything like I that? I will. I definitely have a few hype up songs that I'll play. Um, usually I set the vibe like rolling into the racetrack. I'll play some some of that same style of music yeah. pretty loud in my truck. And then I get there, get set up. But as far as while at the racetrack, I don't hardly ever listen to anything. I have like a, I'll fall into a rhythm. I'll just do one thing a certain, there's no rhyme or reason of what the rhythm is, but if I do something one way when I get to the track, I'll do that the same way until I'm packed up going home. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's, it's kind of funny how people pump themselves up at the track. You like look at, some people will like do a bumper to bumper nut and bolt check. Yeah. Some people don't even care. They're just yeah. chit chatting. I know I have a friend that has to sleep in the staging lines. Like yeah. she'll take a nap. Other people are like punching themselves. And, yeah. So I'm, I like, uh, I'm a big observer, you know, I like to know who I'm racing and what their strategy is, because if I feel as if I can break someone's strategy, that's that kind of person, ah. it's just only going to get in their head and then it'll right. give me the upper hand because with me, I've, I've shaped myself to be the kind of driver that doesn't need anything tailored to whatever. I can go to the racetrack and get any car and perform to what I know I can do. Sure. So I don't want there to be a thing where I got to do this or less. I'm not going to be able to hit the trigger ah, this and that. So I like sense. to, I go off of who I'm racing. Like if they got a, if they got a pattern, I'm there to break it. You that know? makes sense. Got to throw them off their game a little yeah, bit. Yeah. Try to just get that upper hand. Ah. So I got to just start walking around with an air horn or something and some jingle bells. Yeah. Just <laughs> blast it whenever. <laughs> Yeah, there's a, I mean, with that though, there's a few strategies and tricks you learn, especially with the no time stuff. A lot of people don't understand, like, they look at the no time and drudge scene as, oh, those are just guys who can't compete. No, there's a lot of guys in that sport that are just that much better that, you know, can do stuff you've never seen happen in a heads up class style racing. And it's, you learn a lot of tricks that way. I mean, I've, there's been times where I've come out the burnout box and like intentionally shut a car off and made it look like it's broke. And then they're like, oh, they think they got a you know, easier uh, run away. And then you fire back up, put in the beams and they're like, wait, whoa, it just happened kind of deal. You know, it's yeah, that a lot of tricks. Yeah. yeah, that's wild. So I definitely don't want to try to take your spot at Walmart. It sounds like you would fist fight over like a good parking spot. <laughs> yeah, or that or just park over top, yeah. Like if the windows go down and Dr. Dre comes on, it's like, all right. Leave, oh, leave I'm going to get out of this guy's way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's funny. So how did you, you got to get asked all the time, how did you get started with Cleto? Obviously, he knew your yeah. talent and your experience, but how did that, like, start? We, so, you know, at his event and stuff like that, I've helped him with cars. Like, there's an old video from when, um, at, like, I think it was, like, the first or second Cletus and Cars where, they had JH's truck there trying to run over cars. There's a PT Cruiser that still ran. They wanted to blow it up. And they said, who's got a nitrous bottle? And I was like, here I am. Yeah. And we, you know, <laughs> <That's> fogged, <weird>. <laughs> <laughs> fogged this PT Cruiser on the starting line at Bradenton trying to blow it up yeah. with a nitrous bottle. And then, so like, we, we like knew of each other. And then um, 
he made a Facebook post looking for someone to help finish a project. And I just got done doing what he was at. Like he was asking for a wiring guy and I just got done wiring my 240. Yeah. So I sent him a bunch of pictures. I was like, hey, I just got done doing this. If this is what you're looking for, I can help you out. Yeah. Thinking it was just gonna be a part-time thing. And uh, he's like, oh, okay. And then saw that we had mutual friends. So asked the mutual friends and they all told him like, hey, if you're gonna hire anybody, that's your guy. So he reached out to me and was like, hey, come by the shop, you know, see if you're cool, see if you care about the vibe and yeah. pass the vibe check. And then he said, hey, come back tomorrow, we'll start working. It's like, all right. So showed up the next day and he told me he needed someone to wire a project and that was neighbor, the Crown Vic. Yeah, that was and, your first uh, engine swap, right? And what, yeah, I was, to wire it with the Holly, you know, and next thing you know, I get there and it still has the blown up, you know, motor in it from when it blew it up on the dyno. He's like, well, you think you can take it out? I said, yeah, no problem. Pull in a shop, you know, it was like 9.30, pull in a shop. By lunchtime, I was already test fitting that 5.4 out of the, out of the you know, GT500 he had yeah. sitting there wrecked. And he was just mind blown by the ability that I had to be able to just tear it apart and already be there getting a the project going in a forward, forward position. Yeah. And he was just, Went to lunch, we were sitting at Chick-fil-A, he goes, hey, I know I said something about part-time, but you just want to do this for me full-time? And I was like, sure, you know, why not? I'm building the unimaginable, you know, you, he would think up a, a project and I, you know, I was kind of like a yes man because I didn't want to overstep the boundaries of telling him no right away. But you know, I said, yeah, whatever you can think of, I'll try to build. And that's nice. what we did. But it's fine. Well, it's, it's nice too not to have the stress of like footing the bill or trying to yeah, figure all I that mean, out. You're, you could building, just have fun and... you're building bizarre projects without having to worry about. And it's stuff, you know, desirable projects. Like I would totally put that power plant into a chassis like a Panther body, you know, yeah. that it just doesn't belong in but fits just because it's, you know, it's that unique different style deal and not, not to have to pay for any of it right. to get paid to do it. I was right. like, yeah, this is perfect. Yeah, that's a lot of fun for yeah. sure. Do you guys have a project coming up that has like a tight deadline or like what's the next, can yes. you say what the next big reveal is? Oh, everyone knows that we have that Fox body that we call McFlurry. Yeah. And uh, a lot of very expensive parts got ordered and the deadline is sick week, which is, you know, right after the beginning of the year. And it's still <laughs> just a shell sitting on jack stands in the shop. Oh man. So yeah. who's going to be the, the pilot of that thing? I'm going to drive it on sick week. Are you? Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. What's the, would you have like a, an expected? time or like et or like is it just it'll we probably, don't know be, well it'll probably be a mid eight second car off the rip wow. uh, it's going to get a pretty healthy chassis in it we already have a lot of the parts uh we're just going to go ahead and overbuild the chassis for the power plant now so being that it's going to be light it's going to make you know probably 12 1300 horsepower and just on paper everything's squaring out it's going to be you know like a 850 860 car off the wow. rip. so are we going to see a mcflurry versus el toro in the future oh 100 percent. Yeah, yeah that would be pretty awesome that would be fun they are nice cars to build drag cars out of oh they just i call them me two cars because you can go to a race where there's 300 cars on property and 250 of them are fox bikes <laughs> you know <laughs> everybody there, wonders where there's they went. a reason why though because you know they're just they just work and you can have you can buy off the shelf parts for suspension and bolt them on those cars and they just work well Moving on to a segment called Help Me Understand. This is where James or I will attempt to answer your questions, the viewers and listeners, and we've got two that have come up consistently for you. And the first you probably get a lot as well at events and stuff like that is, if someone wants to get into drag racing, how do they get started? Like, what's the first step? So you don't need a race car to go racing. You can take your car you drive every day and go to your local track that probably has a test and tune or what they call like a run day Sunday, probably weekly, if not bi-weekly. And, you know, if you're in a place where it snows, you know, obviously summertime they'll have it. Go there, buy your $20 tech card and just learn how a drag strip works. You'll get the itch. It'll come within the first pass. And from there on out, it'll escalate into a bad habit where you spend all your money on trying to go faster. <laughs> That's a good point, though. Just... Learn the process, yeah. you know, understanding the classes and the staging structure yeah. and the tree and how it works. You know, it's one of those things, the, the track officials that are there on a run day Sunday or like a Tuesday night or a Thursday night test and tune, they are there to help you understand what to do and where to be at the racetrack. So the best thing to do is just go, you know, awesome. get involved. That's great advice. Really great advice. No race car, take dad's car, mom's car, take whatever. daily driver. You got a, you know, a Prius or a pickup. <laughs> you know, whether it's brand new, old, don't matter if it runs and has four tires, take it to the racetrack. There you go. 
I like that. And the other question we got a lot is said person wants to get into drag racing, but they have a small budget to buy a race car or a project car. What would you recommend for someone to like get started? A lot of it is, you know, go with what you like, but go with what you see a lot of. So if you're a GM guy, try to find you, you know, like an old S10 that maybe already has a V8 swap or get you like a fourth gen Camaro or, you know, even a first gen if your budget allows that. Get something that's commonly done in racing because with the aftermarket support that's out there for those chassis, yeah. it makes it easy for the at-home guy that can unbolt and bolt on parts to be able to build the car. Um, a lot of people can't weld or fabricate, you know, or build cages or have a tubing bend or notcher. So obviously once you get to that level, you're still gonna have to source a reputable shop around your area. Right. But if you buy something that's common, that people are already using to race, the aftermarket support out there is huge. You can almost bolt together an eight second car with any of these companies out there. That's a very good point. Try to go with something common. Like obviously a 240 probably wouldn't yeah, be a good not, first choice. Not <laughs> ideal first choice, but I mean, if you're a Ford guy, you can get any generation Mustang. You can make those go eight second quarter mile cars, which yep. is bolt on parts. If you're a GM guy, go Camaro, RS10. S10s you know. are getting quick yeah wasn't there a six second s10 here recently yeah yeah, yeah yeah it was a, a stock bodied one too the big old tire the swedes brought it over for uh drag week man those guys are nuts yeah they're wild okay we're moving on to a segment called asap later so what this is is i'm going to ask you some questions and your job is to immediately give an answer no matter what it is or you're fired okay. i mean like it's got to be right as on. fast as possible okay <coughs> Favorite car movie? Cars 3. Cars 3? Yep. Wow. I got a, my, my, my kid loves it, so I yeah. love it too. You've probably seen it a hundred times then. A week. <laughs> <laughs> a week. Okay, tougher one. Favorite car maker right now? I, I believe GM, Chevrolet. GM, all right. Even though they're going full electric and everything else? Yeah, I mean, they, they had a good past. Okay, makes up for it, got it. Do you have a go-to beverage? Must have. Yeah, Bush Light. Bush Light. <laughs> Unexpected. No, not really. What's your dream car? 69 Camaro. Nice. Like just base, Z28? Z28. 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 Car, yeah. There you go. What tool do you use the most? BMF. Big okay. hammer. Okay. Big old hammer. Really? Mm-hmm. Mallet or like steel? I'm talking four foot. <laughs> break through anything. <laughs> precision <laughs> and he goes 180 with it great do you have a favorite meal after you're wrenching all day you're like i need to get me some of this taco bell taco bell three times a day 10 days a week wow yeah do you Dry have like hard. is it like a number five number three number what? seven chicken extra grilled baja blast what's the number seven quesadilla so casadilla mm -hmm. extra chickens with the baja yep got it you ladies taking notes out there that's <laughs> No, Way to a man's heart. Yeah. <laughs> Extra chickens. We already covered the decade. What else do we have here? Oh, here's a good one. And the last one. Is there a vehicle you would never own, even if given to you? Like, here's the keys, here's the title, it's yours, and you're like, nope, hard pass, keep it. Definitely anything electric, diehard, like Prius, I would right into the ocean. <laughs> so you might accept it, but just immediately <laughs> right to the it. ocean. Yeah. <laughs> What would happen if you dunked one in salt water? I don't know, but someone give me one, we'll find out. We should write this down. <laughs> we have scientific questions mm -hmm. to be answered. Also, everyone says they dump all their batteries in the ocean, so take the batteries right back to where they belong, you know? <laughs> that might be an O'Reilly's, ow, <laughs> over top of that. Well, that's gonna do it for In the Isles, presented by O'Reilly Auto Parts with Jack Stan, Jimmy. Thanks a lot for coming Thank by, Thank you, Derek. Appreciate it. And uh, good luck out there today racing. You too, buddy. Uh, just, just know where friendship ends here now. It's race day. <laughs> All right, man. <laughs>